So thank you for staying this long. Uh, this is joint work with PhD student and undergrad and Rich. Uh, all right, so we all know that adaptive sampling is a basic tool for reduction in uh, many you know, randomized numerical alge linear algebra tasks. But in many machine learning applications, the cost of sampling itself is a bottleneck, and I will illustrate a few of those. So I mean, the, the agenda is I'll try to introduce you what I've been doing over the past three years of viewing locality-sensitive hashing as a sampler. And with this view, we can actually do uh, you know, really uh, you know, show impressive performance with you know, deep learning algorithms and even the gradient descent uh, you know, uh, speed up. And in the end, I'll talk about a very uh, different way of doing sketches using LSH. For example, I'll show you how we can do near neighbor search without storing a single sample or any random projection of that sample. So, okay, so I mean, how many of you know what locality sensitive hashing is? Few. So basically, you know, like in, in computer science, this hash, the concept of hash function is basically you have some object in some space r to the power d, and what you want to do is take this a mapping of this object to some discrete space. And the typical uh, hashing you know, property is that if you have the say, if you, x is equal to y, you want the hash value to be equal, which is there because it's a function. But if x is not equal to y, then you generally want the hash to be different. And this is used for indexing purposes like your hash Java hash maps, etc. But many times what you want is that if I perturb x slightly, I still want the hash to be the same. And to, to achieve this, or something similar, the theory of locality sensitive hashing was developed back in 98, around 97, 98. And basically it relaxes this notion of ideal hashing and says that I, you can actually construct hash function such that the probability of hash agreement is high if the similarity is high, and the probability of hash agreement is low if the similarity is low. And you know, there's, there's a lot known about these functions, but what to keep in mind is that in most cases, the probability of agreement of the hash value is some sort of a monotonic function of similarity between x and y. So if you give me x today, I give you a hash value 5. Tomorrow, if you give me y, I give you hash value 5. That's a probabilistic indicator that x and y are likely to be similar, because 5 agrees. Um, if you want to look at an example, the popular is the sign random projection. So if you have two points here and you want to compute its hash value, you uniformly sample a hyperplane passing through origin, and the hash value simply is which side of the hyperplane the point is. So in this case, both of them get the same hash value. If the hyperplane is sampled like that, they will get opposite hash value. And it is not difficult to see that the probability of hash agreement depends on the angle, which is also the cosine similarity. And it's actually a monotonic function of cosine similarity. Now again, like with, uh, you know, what is the purpose of this kind of hashing is that you can create data structures for near neighbor search. And the whole idea is this. Let's say I have access to some sort of this magical hash functions where probability of agreement is a noisy indicator of high similarity. Then given this database, which is some points, let's say I take two independent initialization of these hash function. Let's say the hash value for this orange point is 0, 0 and 0, 1. So I'll create a hash table, and at location 0, 0, 0, 1, I'll place this orange point. Similarly, I can pre-process all the points. Now, if I'm given a query, which I don't know in advance, so it's very dynamic, I, uh, a new query arise, I will use the same hash function, and let's say the hash value comes out to be 0, 1, and 1, 1. Then instead of using all the data point at potential candidate, I'll just look into bucket 0, 1, and 1, 1. And the argument is that this is a good bucket because the hash has at least collided twice in this case. Because all the points in the bucket 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1 has h1 equal to 0, 1 and h2 equal to 1, 1. And therefore, there is at least two hash agreement with the query. And so I'm already doing better than random just by one bucket probe. And somehow, in computer science, memory access is a fast operation. So in one memory access, I can beat randomization, as in I can get a random a sample which has a very high chance of being similar with the query. And this idea can essentially be you know, boosted, which was the famous algorithm of 98, is that you generate several hash, hash tables, and every hash table consists of the, ad, uh, the, the index is by using some k independent hash functions. And then when you get a query, you probe one bucket in each of the L hash table, take the union of those candidates, and look for near neighbor in those, in those candidates. 
Now obviously since you are not scanning all the elements, there is a chance of this being sublinear and that was the idea. Now some facts about this LSH algorithm, the theory says that it is super linear in memory. So the memory scales something as n to the power 1 plus rho, where rho is some you know like query dependent term. The query time is sublinear, so rho is less than 1, but it generally you know in many application it is large and can be close to 1 and it is often hard to determine, it is very query specific. Now from a practical aspect, if you are doing near neighbor search with LSH, you need to worry about a lot of hash tables and also like you know the buckets can get quite heavy due to poor randomness and unfavorable data distribution. Now having said that, there is another view of LSH which just came into light very recently, uh, which is the sampling view. So here is what is going on. Remember this picture where I placed all the data into the hash table and let's say I get a query and I, and I compute the hash of the query and it turns out to be 0, 0, 1, 0. Then if I go to that bucket, then I know the probability of every element from the data landing in that bucket given this query. In this case, if p is a collision probability, the probability is p square. Because p1 has to agree, the h1 has to agree, and h2 has to agree. And that's how you will land in the bucket. In particular, if you look at the proofs of LSH algorithm, this formula naturally pops up there which is saying that if you are constructing L hash table and each hash table has k locality sensitive hash functions, independent hash functions, then given a query, the probability of finding x is exactly given by this formula, which is basically the probability of not finding x in any of the L hash table and 1 minus that. Now if you look at this expression, if the collision probability is monotonic function of similarity, and this function is a monotonic function of collision probability, so this function is actually a monotonic function of similarity. So this is what is the sampling view. Basically, this is what it says, that I can pre-process a data set into hash tables, and given any query, I have some mechanism to sample data in an adaptive fashion. And by adaptive, I mean that give for a query, x is sampled with higher probability than y, if and only if similarity of x and y, x is more than the similarity of y with the query. And in, in many cases, I can also exactly compute what that sampling probability is. And this will work even with one hash table. So LSH needs a lot of hash table, but even with one or two or very few hash tables, what I am doing is I am sampling with this expression, and the sampling is adaptive. So if your k and l is small, it's roughly constant time sampling. Given a query, you pre-process the data, you hash the query, you probe few buckets, sample data from there. And you also know the sampling probability. Now if you combine these two ingredients, you can see that you can do a lot important sampling estimation. Because for important sampling, all you need is a set of sample and the probability of sampling each. So you can divide by importance weight to get unbiased estimation. And that has been what uh, you know the theme of uh, work so far. So I'll I'll demonstrate how we can do, use this to do a very fast neural neighbor, uh, 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 neural network uh, training. And the idea is using adaptive dropouts. So we all know dropouts randomly shuts off a node just you know by flipping a coin. Now adaptive dropouts basically puts a coin on each of these neurons, and based on the activation of its neurons, it it uh, it drops it. So it keeps high activation neurons with high probability. And it was shown that if you do adaptive dropouts, you can actually make the networks very sparse. So which is great, but computational, computa computationally, that's a nightmare. You first compute all the activation, and then sample. And this is what you can change with hash tables. So you, you basically throw all the neurons, which are just weight vectors, into these locality sensitive hash tables, for gen uh, designed with a hash function is catering to the inner product similarity. Then given a query, given a, an input, you want to do SGD, so you query the first hash table, you, uh, you figure out the sparsity pattern of the first layer, you compute the activation of only those neurons which, are, which you are interested in, and then you can feed forward. So just by a few memory probes, you are able to get a sparsity pattern of the neural network, you feed forward, back propagate. And this, you can actually see that the amount of computation is of the order of active neurons rather than the total number of neurons. So when you update the weights, you also update the hash table. 
So you reorganize your neurons into hash table as the training progresses, and every operation is only of the order of active neurons. So if you can make the networks very sparse, this is an efficient algorithm. And this is what happens. We see in practice, so these are four different data set. The pink line is a dropout. The blue line is sampling using this procedure. The bold black line is the actual neural network which uses full computation. And you can see that roughly you can make the network very sparse most of the time, only utilizing 5% of active neurons. And, and the computation scales truly with the number of active neurons. So this is what one of one, you know, like uh, if the algorithm was this good, then I thought that we should actually put it to practice. So we implemented this in C++ with some you know, system optimization, and this is what we were able to show. So we trained a 125 million parameter network. This was for Amazon recommendation system. And we compare it with TensorFlow on CPU, which is this black line, TensorFlow on GPU, which is this blue line, and this algorithm on the same CPU as this one. This is running time on log scale, and that's the accuracy climb. And this is this picture of the same algorithm from an optimization perspective. We are looking at iterations. So optimization-wise, it looks the same, but because the cost of the iteration is so fast, and we did it in, you know, because we wrote it in C++, we don't want to use matrix multiplication and GPUs. This is like 1,000 times faster from a computational perspective, and so it did translate into a very good speed up over the GPU. And this is NVIDIA V100, the best GPU available on TensorFlow. This is using Intel's MKL library, the best library for, uh, for training neural networks on CPU. And you can beat them. This is what randomized algorithms can do. So you know, I thought that you know, like we had the first paper already there, so there is no point of putting this. So we just put it on archive and realized that a week later there was an article on this, which is you know, which is, all right. So coming back to uh, you know, coming back to this uh, LSH as a sampler, I think uh, you know. Okay, by the way, for that one, the trick is the title has to be fancy. So the title was in defense of smart algorithms over hardware acceleration. <laughs> okay, anyway, so uh, when we look at the, uh, I think this LSH and the sampling view of LSH changes the landscape of weighted sampling. So if you have this fundamental question of if you are given n weights and I want to sample xi in proportion to these weights, if I want to do one sample, it's order n because I have to read the weights first. But if I do I have to do subsequent sampling, it's still order n because I can create some you know, data structures. But if these weights are changing over time, and at time t, I have to sample xi in proportion to wit, then, I th then it seems that there is nothing better than at least first reading those weights and then sampling. It turns out that there, is, there are functions of these forms. If the weight has this kind of very specific form, then you can do it in, again, roughly order one. And I think that there is a lot of such functions there. And this is where I think statistics and randomized data structures should talk more, because this is where it can change things. Now, if you're wondering why, why, is, why is this even important, here is the, another classical example, which is faster gradient descent. So everybody knows in an optimization literature, we have a gradient descent algorithm, which is very slow, because every iteration is order n. Then we have stochastic gradient descent, which is slow convergence-wise, but fast in time, because every iteration is order 1, whereas the gradient descent, every iteration is order n. I mean, what can beat flipping a coin and taking something and making an update? Now, if you look at the literature, can we, beat, can we do better than SGD? The answer is yes. If you sample xi in proportion to some probability wi, where wi is related to the L2 norm of the gradient or some sort of a leverage score, then obviously you can do better because you get better gradient estimates. But hang on for a second. The weights, L2 norm of a gradient, changes with the parameter, and so it changes in every iteration. So if you, it requires order n work to even get to this. It's better you just do gradient descent rather than doing any sampling. Because it's order n. You have to first read the weights. But if you think about it, the least squares, the L2 norm of a gradient, can be decomposed into some sort of an inner product, which is just one term dependent only on the parameter and the other term dependent on the data. So this is what something you can do, is you can pre-process the data into LSH hash tables. Every time you get a parameter, you query, profile bucket, and sample an element from there. Now this time, 
you are doing slightly costlier than random sampling. You are computing a hash function and probing a bucket. Roughly, it's 1.5 times the cost of random sampling if you're doing sparse hashes. So it better be fast, but the good thing is you, you compute the gradient, divide by the sampling probability, and divide by n to get an unbiased estimator of a gradient. Now, this picture shows three different data sets. Why is the variance there? Uh, the variance is uh, it's a data dependent reason. Because uh, so the gradient is a sum, right? And there are few terms with heavy norm and few terms with low, uh, you know, small norms. So you, are, you can guarantee that the heavier norms are being sampled more often than the non-heavier ones, because the, that's the relationship. What is it if, they, if they're uniform? Is it equal? Oh, the, so uniform would, be, uniform would be equal, because then it has to, because it, it, the, you know, like, so that is if and only if. You will sample xi more often than y, if and only if x has higher similarity than the y. So it's, so if it's, sim it's, it's better than, or, the variance is better than or equal. But not always. It's just monotonic. So you, you can actually show bad cases too. So, but in general, in practice, it works very well. So for example, uh, this is the alignment of the true gradient with your sampled gradient. So you sample a gradient, you compute a true gradient, and see what is the cosine similarity between this. This is random sampling, and this is sampling using hash tables. And with this kind of approach, you can show something like this. So the blue lines are the trained, the dotted is test, the blue is trained. This is random sampling, this is sampling using LSH. This is ADA grad and plain SGD. So we have a plug and play method. You give me your favorite gradient descent algorithm, ADA grad Adam. I give you a gradient estimator. There are two gradient estimator here is one is random gradient estimator, the other is the LSD gradient estimator. And then you run whatever algorithm you like. Now this is epoch-wise convergence, which is obviously better because of a better variance, but you can also show the same thing holds for time-wise iteration. The, the biggest issue is like if you if you, you know in many operation in many adaptive sampling. By the time you take one step, SGD will take a million step if you have million data points. So this plot does not mean anything. But you can go to, you can really be faster in time if you're doing something which is 1.5 to the cost of flipping a coin. That's probably okay. All right, so I'll, I'm going to change gear and talk about really tiny memory data structures for doing near neighbor search and essentially without storing a single sample. So remember, we had this hash table, LSH hash tables. Now what I want to do is, in hash tables, you have a bucket and you're storing elements in this. Now you forget about this hash table and only look at the counts of how many elements are there in that bucket. So when you are adding, you don't go and add it to the bucket, but you go to a counter and increment it. Now if you think about it, this is good enough information, because let's say I get a query and I go to a bucket and it has zero elements. That tells me something that this might be an anomaly, right? And essentially, that is what is happening is you can show, yeah, OK. So, so the algorithm is as simple as this. You take all the data set. You compute the LSH value of that. The hash, uh, the, the value, the LSH, let's say, is 5. You go to an array at location 5, you increment its count. Now. The question that we want to ask is, what are these counts? You can show that if a query goes to a bucket, and it's uh, whatever the value of its count is, that count is actually a kernel density. Where the kernel is the collision probability of LSH raised to power k, where k is something that you can choose, and it's sum over all the data set. You can show that this count is an unbiased estimator of this, and which is as simple as using your indicator. Indicator that this point goes to that bucket, and that, that, that gives you that sum. So it's actually a kernel density. The thing is, you are estimating this kernel density of a complete data set just using small arrays. And it is true for any query. All right, so this, is one, this was like back in 2018 where we showed that you can use this kernel density to do anomaly detection. And again, like the same kind of argument holds here is that this is much efficient than doing random sampling because this is adaptive. I mean, things which have in high values of kernels are likely to be in, the, in, in your bucket, and so you do a better estimation than random sampling. But there's something more. Like, I, whenever I take a hash value, I go to a bucket, add myself up. But I can subtract. I can decide to ignore. And instead of adding one, I can add any ri. So in general, I can just not only estimate this kernel density, but actually estimate any linear combination like this. So this quantity 
is the collision probability of the query with xi raised to power k. And this is any ri that I can imagine. And I can estimate these guys. Because every count, so for example, I take the hash value, go to a particular uh, you know, bucket, and decide to add ri times whatever I, you know, 1 into it. And so I'll get this. Now this is what the key is. Imagine this vector. What is this vector? This vector is the probability of collision of query with xi is the first component, x2 is the second component, xi is the ith component, xn is the nth component, an n-dimensional vector like this. Now just by using few arrays of counts, what given any query, I can estimate any linear combination of that vector. Okay? Now this vector is collision probability, which is monotonic in similarity. And so if k is large enough, and assuming some separation, the heavy elements of these vectors are precisely the near neighbors. I am never materializing this vector, because if I materialize it, that's order n. But I can estimate any linear combination of this vector. So if this vector is sparse, and if compress sensing work, I should be able to recover it. And that's the idea. So here is a setting that I am talking about when I say near neighbor search, yes. Yeah, the variance is actually high. So you, the, all the hardness goes into the variance computation. You're right. So basically, the problem setting is we are having a stream of vectors. We observe xt at time t, and we are not allowed a second pass. I'm imagining a data structure which is roughly sublinear, so less than n storage. And I want to answer a near neighbor query, but near neighbor query will just be the index. So if you give me a query, I'll say that the closest point to this q was point number j. Because I have not stored the data, so I have no idea what that data is. If you think about JL lemma, JL lemma will give you n log n because you know, it's the, JL, the usual JL lemma. All the LSH and credit trees are super linear in memory. And they generally require storing the data in some form or random projection of that in some form. So here is the algorithm. And by, if, uh, the design matrix that I'm using is count min sketch. So I'm only using ri as 0 as 1 ones. So here is what happened. I initialize a set of arrays. And again, these things are just the repetition to take the median of means and get a concentration on those variants. Okay? So don't worry about what that is behind. It's also an identical array, but independent randomization. Now let me, let's, let's say I get a point x1. I compute a hash of x1, and I get three. So something like count min sketch. I decided to put in three based on one. Then I use the LSH associated with each array and compute the LSH value of this guy. Let's say it turns out to be 3, 5, and 2. Then I go and increment those count. And then I ignore x1 and go on to the next. So this way, I pre-process all the data. And this is going to be my sketch. So I'm not storing any attributes. I mean, we can talk about privacy. The privacy argument is very nice. No attributes, no random projection. Everything just go to a particular count, uh, a particular location, and increment its count. Now, when I have to do the query, I, I take the query and go to every of these arrays and look at the count that is there, which the query lands to. So every array is associated with the LSH hash function. You compute the LSH of the query for corresponding to this array, go to that particular location, take the count. In each of this, you do a median of means or something to get this value. And this is your compressed sensing values, which you do sparse recovery on. Or you can actually, because it's count min sketch, you just have to do a min, which is even easier. So again, we, what, we, what each of this quantity is a linear combination of these guys. If this vector, which is the values of the, where every component, the ith component is a value of this, is sparse, then I can recover the heavy elements, which are the near neighbors. Now, if you want to look at the guarantees, the way to make this sparse is increase the k and assume a gap. And this is interesting because it natural. So if you want to look at how the simulation goes, this is what happens if the data is something like a social network data, where you have two friends are very close and a random guy is not at all close. Then you get something like this. These are like the non-neighbor similarity, and these are the neighbor similarity, and you can recover them. Uh, the nice thing about this is that the hardness of near neighbor search is actually the hardness of compressibility of the similarity vector. So remember, 
if you have a point like this where all the points away from it are very close to each other, then it's very hard to make that similarity vector sparse. Because you have to make k like insanely high and then that will increase the variance. But if you have something like this where we have something which is very, very close and most of them are very far, then the px, the vector of the collision probability raised to power k with large enough k can be made very sparse. And if it can be made very sparse, it can be recovered. And this is what happens, and you get a theoretical guarantee like this, that the memory requires is data dependent. You cannot have data independent guarantees. n to the power b, b depends on high, how high this collision probability of the good points are, how good the gap is between the good and the bad point, and also the space required by your hash functions. So we did an experiment, actually, because this was a very easy algorithm, right? When the algorithm is hash, count, increment, and then you know estimate. So we use the Google social network graph with 100k nodes. And why social network graph? Because this has that property that if you have guys which are similar, they have very high similarity. And two random elements almost have zero similarity. And this is the result. So I'm looking at compression. There's random sampling. There's random projection. So random projection is basically you keep projecting it to smaller and smaller dimension, and then do exact near neighbor to get a recall. That's how, you get project, uh, that how, that's how you get compression with random projection. And that's the one with this algorithm race. Just few arrays of counts. And if the data has good sparsity, you get a very high recall. How, how do you calculate the, the compre uh, compressed size? Do you bit. measure by bit or by number of bits? Both. Actually, if you do both, it won't take. Because uh, we, uh, like the bits is we assume 32 bits for any measurement. So, uh, so, so if I do random projection and then I do quantization, then which one will be better? Uh, so this is, I think, this is the, this is without any quantization. But that's true even with that. So for example, with race, the counts are not going to be big. So you can actually even quantize that. So I, I don't think the difference will change. All right. And actually, this is all I have to say. So you know, like if you think about LSH and data structure at samplers, I think there is a whole world out there. And what I have shown is just a few possibility. And I look forward to you know, pushing this direction more. Thank you. For this uh, nearest neighbors problem, as you had it, uh, with this, a variety of hashes and everything, what was the asymptotic space complexity for that? Uh, the asymptotic space complexity for, uh, for which algorithm? Uh, the, the stacks of nearest neighbor hash tables. Oh, this one? This is, this is the space complexity. OK. So it's, it's data dependent. You cannot have a generic one, because it will uh, then there are like indexing problem and other lower bounds that you will beat. But it's data dependent. If you have a big enough gap, and if you have like something close, which is essentially the hardness of near neighbor search. But what you can do is now argue that the hardness of near neighbor search is the same as the hardness of compressed sensing, and uh, you know, like, uh, the compressibility of a similarity vector. Yeah, yeah. But so I'm assuming that these are all independent of m. Otherwise, uh, it becomes like so. You don't even want the collision probability to be very small, because uh, if if you assume that the collision probability goes small with m, then it's uh, then again you use. Uh, yeah, the 1 over delta. The delta is also like, if you, so if you assume a random data model, this doesn't hold true, because then the gap will go down. Yeah. But this is, again, like if the data is very well clustered. For example, social network graphs, right? Yeah. Which is poorly clustered, but every query has something which is very close, and everything else is like far apart. But I mean, but what I'm excited about is that you can turn this, because it's only arrays and counts. You can talk to maybe IoT people, because the anomaly detection algorithm, we were we were able to compress a complete data into 4 MB, which can actually sit in your cache, and you can do anomaly detection on that. And it's, again, streaming, online, distributed. You have multiple. Just add them up. You know, it's count min sketch with LSH, sort of. Sort of.